Goede dag kijkers, welkom bij een nieuwe aflevering van ons programma In Gesprek Met. In het eerste deel hebben we een bijzonder onderwerp. Het gaat namelijk over de inheemse dag die we aanstaande vrijdag zullen herdenken. In dat kader is er vanaf vandaag, 7 augustus, een Amazonemarkt gaande in Palmenduin. En daarover praten we met Quincy Sabayo. Hij is de ja, een vertegenwoordiger van Stichting Amazone Market, maar ook de Stichting Herdenking in Hiemse Dag Suriname. En we praten ook met een Paul Wow, danser uit de Verenigde Staten. Hij is speciaal in Suriname voor de activiteiten in verband met de Inheemse Dag. Kijkt u mee naar het interview. Mr. Quincy Sabayo en Mr. Mark Ramos, welkom in ons programma in gesprek met. Ik start met jou, uh, Mr. Sabayo, en ik zal deze part in Dutch. Um, in verband met de inheemse dag bent u vandaag in onze studio en gaat u ons vertellen waarom meneer Ramos eigenlijk met ons meegekomen is. Als we naar hem kijken, dan heeft hij heel wat veren. En ja, een hoofdtooi op, dat is helemaal mooi. Mm -hmm. um, maar laten we beginnen met de inheemse dag. Waarom is het zo belangrijk dat we in Suriname aandacht schenken aan deze dag? Nou, het is enorm belangrijk voor ons inheemse dat wij, wij zeggen niet vieren, wij zeggen of wij herdenken mm -hmm. dag de inheemse in Suriname. Omdat, uh, zoals uh, men hoeft niet te vertellen, S uh, wij inheemse zijn de eerste in dit land. En uh, uh, om het heel kort te houden, want misschien kan het een beetje... Uh, je kunt vertellen ja, wat je wilt vertellen je? hoor. Ja, maar uh, <coughs> bij Inimse zijn natuurlijk het, 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 de, eerste, de eerste in dit land. En uh, wat het geschiedenis betreft natuurlijk hebben we veel, veel moeten meemaken. En, uh, en zoals velen niet weten, Suriname is dan de enige uh, in de wereld waar uh, Inimse dag... Um, tot een nationale dag uh -huh. uh, wordt herdag natuurlijk. In vele andere landen heb je een nieuwste dag op andere dagen. Um, uh, in, in, in Guyana vieren ze Heritage Month in september. Uh, in, in, in Amerika heb je ook gezegd dat ze in oktober ook. En in andere landen ook op andere dagen. Uh, maar uh, in Suriname is 9 augustus officieel uh, gesteld of uh, opgebracht. Natuurlijk door uh, de Verenigde Naties. En voor ons in Nieuws is het uh, is heel belangrijk. Omdat uh, ja, uh, we willen erkend worden natuurlijk als uh, de eerste burger van dit land. En nog and andere rechten die nog erkend moeten worden. Ja. Omdat wij uh, beter doen maar ik laat het dan uh, op dat even zo. Ja, in Suriname hebben we heel veel werk als het aankomt op de erkenning van de rechten van de inheemse en tribale volken. Ja, maar we zien dat er altijd nog progress is en dat de inheemse gemeenschap moeite maakt om die erkenning te krijgen die ze nodig mm. hebben. We merken ook dat een, um, er veel wordt gesproken over een, um, dat de cultuur een, um, verloren gaat en mm. dat we het in stand moeten houden. Mm. Hoe doen jullie dat? Vooral in het kader van inheemse dag. Ja. Hoe pro proberen jullie dat te doen? Nou, um, zoals u zei, uh, het cultuur, uh, laat me zeggen, nu het verschil is het wel een beetje, is nu een beetje anders geworden. Mm -hmm. Toen de tijd was ons cultuur aan het uh, vervagen. Mm -hmm. uh, en als ik moet zeggen, ook de taal, ik ben zelf niet uh, vloeiend in de taal. Ik kan misschien enkele woorden nog opzeggen, ik kan nog enkele woorden ook verstaan. Uh, en, uh, maar het ging meer om dat uh, vroeger, uh, als ik het goed heb, mochten uh, de inimse kinderen... Uh, waren verplicht Nederlands te spreken. Mm -hmm. En uh, zo werd het ook toen de tijd ook naar huis gestuurd dat je verplicht Nederlands uh, moest leren aan je kinderen. Waardoor de, onze voorouders toen de tijd, ik weet niet als ik het goed heb hoor, maar uh, werd mij verteld dat onze voorouders zich heel veel op dat gebied van onderwijs, van hé, hey, um, je gaat naar school, dat probeer gewoon Nederlands te spreken, laat het in je weten. Zo. So, uh, voor mij was de school belangrijk. Snap je? Uh, maar voor mij natuurlijk vind ik het best jammer dat ik, het niet, uh, dat ik niet vloeiend ben erin. Mm -hmm. Mijn wijle vader die was vloeiend in het Arawakse taal. Uh, en, en hij leerde ons wel op een latere leeftijd enkele woorden. Snap je? Mm -hmm. en, 
Dus uh, het was al een beetje, ik zou zeggen, het was al een beetje te laat ervoor. Maar ja, mm. ik ben tenminste blij dat hij me toch wat heeft kunnen leren. Um, nu, ik zie een heel groot verschil wat dat betreft uh, 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 vervangen van onze cultuur. Ik zie dat onze jongeren nu wel interesse hebben in onze mm. cultuur. Uh, als ik moet zeggen, um, anderen beginnen een, een eigen culturele groep op te richten waar jongeren zelf zitten. Uh, ik, ik, kan, ik kan groepen noemen, bijvoorbeeld een groep uit Hollandse Kamp. Daarachter Sanderij is er een groep Waboqua, waarbij een, uh, een groep nu onder leiding staat van een jonge dame zelf. Ik denk in de leeftijd 20, 21. Mm-hmm. En daar heeft zij ook een uh, heel jongere van 4, 5 jaar al onder haar. Um, uh, ik noem een bekende jongere namen, bijvoorbeeld Sero uh, Jubitara, ook een jonge zanger. Ook uh, bezig in de, in, in de ondernemerwereld. Um, hij is heel vroeg begonnen met. Uh, Zingen in het inheems, hij komt uit uh, Bijevoika. Um, hij doet in de Sambor, hij doet ook in het Kaskabi. Um, die hebben ook groepen, uh, aan de andere dag een groep bij Raadje, waar alleen maar jongeren er zitten. Mm-hmm. Je, je, kan, je kan zien dat ze alleen maar jongeren, je ziet bijna geen oudere persoon, dus het is alleen maar jongens. En, uh, dus, en nu zien we ook uh, dat er weer een misverkiezing wordt gehouden onder de inheemse, onder de inheemse en waarbij je kan zeggen dat het echt jonge dames zijn. En als ik moet, als ik moet, als ik moet kijken, gemiddeld, kijk zeggen, zijn jonge dames van gemiddeld 18, 19 jaar. En uh, ik heb ze kunnen meemaken bij de oefening. En ik zeg van, nou, nou onze, de, de jongeren beginnen onze cultuur weer op te pakken. Zijn nu echt weer geïnteresseerd in de inheemse cultuur. Ja, en mm. los van de eigen initiatieven van jongeren binnen de inheemse gemeenschap. U vertegenwoordigt vandaag de Stichting Amazone Mark en Stichting Herdenking Dag der Inheemse Volkeren in Suriname. Uh, wat doet vooral de Stichting Herdenking aan de bewustwording en bevordering van de inheemse cultuur? Nou, um, wat we daarmee uh, doen, of wat we willen doen natuurlijk, uh, is het vorm van workshops geven natuurlijk, mm-hmm. lezingen doen, uh, uh, zoals... Uh, we hadden ook vorig jaar nog, uh, een, hoe noem je dat weer, een crew toe georganiseerd. Uh, waarbij we verschillende inheemse organisaties bij elkaar riepen om te praten over de, de, onze inheemse problemen. Mm-hmm. Wat voor oplossingen kunnen we vinden enzovoort enzovoort. Uh, dus los van dat we, we horen zich niet alleen bezig met de inheemse dag. We houden ons ook bezig met uh, tal van andere uh, problemen of activiteiten die we kunnen uh, als we ook kijken wat we daarbij kunnen doen. En uh, vaag genoeg, um, de leiding ligt onder mevrouw Yusin Aluma Tuku. Mm-hmm. Uh, en uh, dat is ook een van onze adviseurs. Uh, en uh, zij leidt ons ook even op hoe we dan bepaalde projecten kunnen oppakken, bepaalde problemen kunnen oplossen. Uh, maar je weet, uh, niet, je kan niet altijd iedereen tevreden stellen. Niet iedereen kan je tevreden stellen, maar uh, wij van Stichting Amazone maar en Stichting Herdenking proberen waar we kunnen. En uh, als het niet genoeg is, geven we ook niet op. We gaan, gewoon, we gaan altijd proberen wat we kunnen doen. Yes. En uh, in verband met dus aanstaande vrijdag, dan vieren we groot in Suriname of herdenken we groot de inheemse dag. En in dat kader hebben jullie een gast uit het buitenland. Kunt u me vertellen wie hij is, want hij zit net naast u. Ja, eh... Uh, in het kader van Inheemse Dag, uh, we houden het dit keer drie dagen, 7, 8 en 9 augustus in de Palmentuin. Um, ik ben ons eerst onze thema even vergeten, um, geen nood. Mm-hmm. Um, het is meer om bij elkaar te komen, broederschap, uh, uh, we, we eisten onze erkenning als het ware ook, daar, is, daar gaat onze thema een beetje ervoor. En um, ik heb naast mij hier de heer Mark Ramos, die zich ook uh, uh, verantwoordelijk voelt bij uh, de thema wat we hebben. Ik zou eigenlijk vorig jaar ook in Suriname zijn, maar uh, door enkele, ik denk dat hij zijn vlucht had gemist in Denver en uh, is het niet gelukkig om hem hier te krijgen. Maar van het jaar heeft hij ervoor gezorgd van, hey, uh, you know, ik kom eerder. Ik heb de 2 augustus hier. Um, dus de Mark Ramos komt uit natuurlijk USA, uh, Washington, Spokane, zeg ik dat? Spokane. Yes. Yeah. 
and uh, he's from the which tribe is it? Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene tribe, and uh, he's here. He's a powwow dancer. Yeah. Uh, what the powwow precies is, zal hij zelf uitleggen. En hij is onze hoofdact van al deze drie dagen. Dus de mensen zullen hem zien, bewonderen in de palmentuin. Hij gaat ook zelf optreden voor de president daar. En uh, ja, uh, dus hij is hier mooi gekleed. Uh, wat verder betreft zal hij zelf moeten vertellen. <laughs> yes. Oh. Uh, long, uh, I got here on Friday mm -hmm. and I will be flying out on Saturday. And what is your opinion about Suriname? My opinion? Um, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> but it I don't sure mind is. it. It's a different type of heat. We had 105 in Spokane this weekend. Um, I think it was maybe in the 90s here. But how I uh, can compare it to, because I've been in humid places like Fort Knox, mm -hmm. Kentucky, or Ohio. The humidity is different here. It's to me like going into a laundry room all day. <laughs> but I've endured. I've adjusted to it. I'll make it through. But I, I love what I'm experiencing so far. It's been uh, great. Even though I am not sleeping very much. Yesterday <laughs> got like an hour and a half. <laughs> and we were just going at it again today. So that's what I want to make uh, the most out of my time here. It's my first time in South America. Mm, okay. And so I'm happy to be here. And uh, what do you think about the indigenous uh, culture here in Suriname? Well, I have very little knowledge. That's why I think this is great to be here so I can s meet the people firsthand, um, hear their stories, songs, dances, and just to have like a cultural exchange because mm -hmm. I'm sure they're going to be learning just as much about me as I am with them but I'm excited to find out as much more about the Amazon tribes before yes. here. Soon and now. since yesterday I'm hearing we'll have a powwow dancer here in our studio, so do you want to do an interview with him? But I was like, what is a powwow dancer? So mm. can you tell us <laughs> what an, um, is the background of a powwow dancer? Um, powwows are celebrations. They're done in uh, North America, so the Canadian First Nation tribes do it, the U.S. tribes. Um, I haven't heard any in Mexico. So what we do is, it, they're usually three-day celebrations, start on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and people travel from powwow to powwow. Like this last weekend, there was a powwow on the Cowspell tribe, but it's north of Spokane by 50 minutes. That's mm -hmm. the one I usually go to. And then there was one in Rocky Boy, Montana. So each weekend there's a powwow where people come together and they uh, celebrate through dancing, through their songs. They have stick games and it's just a fun event where the dancers are able to um, compete against each other. I don't compete. I just go out for myself for the fun of it. But there are some dancers who win and that's how they make an extra money on their for their living. Um, but me, I just go to regional powwows that are in my area. But some people will drive 20 hours, 18 hours to get to uh, a different powwow, whether it's in the U.S. or Canada. Yes. And um, can you tell us about your background, how you got into the world of dance? I was born into it. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I was four years old when I first started dancing. Um, I was a traditional dancer. And then... <laughs> When I became a teen teenager, I thought I was too cool for dancing. <laughs> and I regret missing those years because it was when I was 22 when I started back to dance. And I'm 58 now. So I don't know how many years that's, uh, I've been dancing all over mm -hmm. again. But it's just uh, great to be dancing for the people out on the on, uh, circle when all the other uh, dancers are out there because there's Three men categories, men's tradition, which is what I am, uh, grass, and fancy bustle. And then for the women, there's women's traditional, jingle dress, and fancy. So those are the different styles. And I'm going to show everybody what the five different songs that I do when mm -hmm. I perform. Okay. And how do you prepare yourself to do a performance? Um, I start doing a lot of stretching and running. Uh, 
because you look, you do lose, use a lot of energy out there. Mm -hmm. Some powwows are indoor, some are outside. So you are in the sun. Um, the hottest I ever danced uh, at a powwow was 112 in Kamloops, British Columbia. Um, so you use a lot of energy when you're out there. So I used to run, but um, you don't use the same muscles mm -hmm. as dancing. So now I'm dancing in my living room. I don't get in my outfit. I just throw on what Quincy's looking like and just go do a few songs just to give me my cardio mm -hmm. because then I'm going down low and using muscles that I don't do when I'm biking or running. So you do have to keep your weight down. And actually last year when I was coming here, I was about 218. Um, I'm about two, I think I'm about two five now with all the eating I've been doing <laughs> with uh, while I've been here. But um, it helps when you're, you're uh, in shape for, for mm -hmm. the dancing because you do use a lot of energy. Yes, and what does it mean to you to perform on Igi Indigenous Day in Suriname? It's an honor. Um, it's an honor to come and share, and for some, I'm sure some of the folks, this is the first time they're going to see this style of dancing. So it's a privilege to be here and just um, do these different performances. So, yeah, I'm excited. And what is the cultural significance of the powwow in your dance and costumes? The significance? Mm -hmm. Uh, can, can you repeat that again? Um, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, what is the cultural significance of the powwow in your dance or in the costume? Um, the cultural significance would be that we're passing our traditions on to the next generation. So it shares with us who we are, where we come from, and honors our mm -hmm. ancestors for what they did. Um, they persevered and were here because of them. So it's up to the parents' responsibility or grandparents to teach their children or grandchildren so they can p keep our culture alive for the future generations. So just um, to let you know, it, we don't call our outfits costumes. We mm -hmm. say regalia, oh. our outfit. Um, when we say, people say costume, they think of like if you're out Halloween, trick or treating. Yes. So we refer to our outfits, regalia, okay. our outfits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What we wear, okay, there we go. Okay, and how do you aim to convey cultural messages and stories through your dance? Um, well, each category, they can do stories. Mm -hmm. um, they say men's tradition are st the storytellers. Um, the women's jingle dress, that's another one. That's a, a healing dance. Uh, the story behind that is the women, uh, w there was a woman that was crippled. She couldn't dance, so she prayed to the creator. The creator came to her and told her to make this significant, uh, specific type of dress. And he instructed her to put a cone on the dress for each day of the year mm -hmm. as a prayer. So there's 365 cones on a dress. Not all women wear 365, but um, some can wear 100 or 50. It just depends because 365 is a lot of weight <laughs> yes. on the dress. And so um, when she woke up, she did what the creator came and told her in a dream. She could dance. She got on the floor. So these are s different stories with significant and meaning behind what style each dancer is doing. And when we're out there, whether it's a grass dancer or a fancy dancer, there are certain stories they are telling. Yes. Okay. And what are some of your most memorable performances so far? My most memorable? Uh, I've danced internationally. The mm. first time was 93. I was in the Netherlands. And I was there for about 21 days doing shows all over, danced in Germany. And that's how I got here. Oh. I met Eric Van Stratton. And then in 2013, so 20 years later, I was at Gonzaga University in my master's program. And I studied in Italy. 
So when Eric found out I was there, he said, come see me. So I did. Then I met Waldy. Mm -hmm. And Waldy um, came, took some photos of me, and then he came to my uh, country in 2017, did a, a documentary on our powwow called Jalayamsh. He stayed, and then it was last year, he called me and told me about what was, because uh, he's originally from here. And so he told me about Suriname. I had no idea where it was at. <laughs> told me about uh, what was going on with the celebration, and I was in. I said, yeah, I want to do it. <laughs> Other folks that I told from back home, like, why would you want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> where is it? And I'd explain, and like, it doesn't have to be r Brazil or Ecuador. I mm -hmm. mean, they are just as uh, important as the rest of the world. So I was saying, yeah, let's do it. So I was disappointed that it didn't happen last year, but I'm glad I'm here and um, we're going to do our best and have some fun with, with uh, the weekend, or the week, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and what are your future plans and ambitions within the dance, and, uh, within the dance world? My ambitions, dance as long as I can. Uh, I'm in the golden age. <laughs> this, uh, they have different age categories, so mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's 55 and up, and sometimes it's 60 and up. So that's why I want to keep my weight down and keep in shape and as dance as long as I can. And they recognize when the dancers, and even the dancer like me, I know, oh, my knee is going out. I, I'm not dancing like I used to when I was younger. So when they dance us, the golden age, they give us one song, mm. which is enough. Um, uh, with the younger guys, they do two, sometimes three. So I want to dance as long as I can, um, even if it, you know, it's into my 70s or 80s, because we do have some dancers out there, like Stephen Small Salmon um, from the Salish tribe, Montana. He's an elder must be mid-70s, but he's still out there. It's interesting. Um, looking to the, the program of the Amazona market we're going to have here in Suriname, how do you hope the audience will respond to your performance? Well, I hope they don't throw tomatoes and rocks at me. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I know they won't. I they think won't. That I think they will appreciate what they mm -hmm. see, what they hear. Um, how I want it to be is with the video background to watch the YouTube video of the drum group mm -hmm. rather than just hearing the song they're gonna s see the drum group with me in the stage and some of the videos I have it's the drum group only and then there's a crow hop where I use um, where you see the dancers so there's one where I think there's about 30 other dancers out there on the floor and then I'll be live mm -hmm. so that's what I, the visual effect, I want them to appreciate what they see, what yes. they hear. And are there specific messages you hope to convey to your audience? I really didn't think about that. I, I just thinking, you know, it's, it's unique uh, that we have northern indigenous folks coming together, uh, southern indigenous folks to bring our positive energy and and spread it to the universe mm -hmm. to um, give praise to the Creator and to our ancestors. Yes, yeah. and do you have any plans to collaborate with indigenous dancers or artists from Suriname in the future? I'll see what happens. Uh, there could be something that I don't know yet. Um, maybe when I start meeting folks that could be a possibility. Mm -hmm. And if I am available, uh, I would do it. Um, but it's a long trip. It yeah. took me, I left at 7 a.m. on Thursday and got here at 4 p.m. on Friday. So, and I probably got maybe two hours of sleep on the plane. But um, yeah, it would be nice if I network and connect with more folks and, and s just see what happens. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ramos, and yes, thank you for welcome. being here to share your culture with us. Uh, back to Mr. Sabayo. Uh, my last question, Mr. Ramos, is there, are there plans to be able to build a sing dance to learn younger inheims, yeah, younger inheims here in Suriname? Um, uh, the plans are there, sowieso. 
Uh, maar we moeten nog met hem gaan zitten. Praten erover natuurlijk. Net dat hij zei, hij heeft uh, drie dagen, drie dagen of vier dagen, uh -huh. uh, moeten reizen naar Suriname. Uh, de bedoeling is om hem weer volgend jaar hier te krijgen. Oh, uh -huh. En uh, niet alleen dat hij misschien tenminste toch komt met uh, twee andere groepen, twee andere mensen yeah. om te komen dansen. Dat is de bedoeling. Uh, en misschien ook waarbij hij ook workshop kan geven. Uh -huh. uh, maar we moeten nog gaan zitten praten yeah. met hem. Uh, want uh, zoals hij zei, hij reist rond. Uh, na Suriname weet ik niet waar hij gaat. <laughs> <laughs> hij alleen weet waar hij gaat. Yeah. Maar, uh, uh, um, maar uh, hij kijkt ernaar uit om volgend jaar weer hier te zijn. Okay. Hopelijk, ik, hoop, ik hoop het ook dat het ons lukt om hem weer te kunnen krijgen hier in Suriname. Volgend jaar. En misschien met... Uh, met, uh, hij zei, hij heet um, zijn familie, ook, ook zijn, zoon, zijn kinderen, zijn zoon, hij mm -hmm. danst ook samen met zijn zoon. Dus we hopen dat hij misschien tenminste met één, twee of drie personen nog kan komen om een total show te geven. Ja, ja. precies. Mm -hmm. Oké, okay. en aan, um, aan het eind nu, heeft hij een boodschap aan de inheemse bevolking ja. in Suriname? Ja, oké. Okay. Um, een boodschap natuurlijk. Uh, laten we standaard wat is altijd dat we altijd willen is het, het eenheid vormen onder ons natuurlijk. Uh, het stoppen met elkaar uh, uh, tegen elkaar gaan strijden. Dat hoeft, hoeft niet altijd. We hebben allemaal één standpunt dat we willen. En laten we daarvoor gaan natuurlijk. Laten we niet alleen gaan bundelen of altijd elkaar gaan verwijzen op één nieuwste dag alleen. Mm -hmm. Laten we elkaar uh, de ene blijven uh, behouden. In alles, wat, in alles dan, uh, wat, wat maakt nu uit, wat dan ook. Um, laten we elkaar niet neerhalen natuurlijk. Um, probeer alles op een positieve en natuurlijk peaceful manier te gaan oplossen. Want we weten wat laatst is gebeurd, twee jaar geleden is het niet goed afgelopen. Maar we willen dat gaan weer gaan vermijden. En, en dat willen we niet meer laten gebeuren. Dus laten we alles gewoon... Uh, alles wat we voor oplossing zoeken op een peaceful manier gaan zoeken. Ja, um, ik zeg altijd in het kader van inheemse dag, is het niet alleen om te vieren, laten we ook gaan herdenken, laten we gaan bezinnen, uh, goed nadenken, uh, kijken wat wij uh, kunnen doen, kijken waar we anderen kunnen helpen. En uh, ja, dat is eigenlijk mijn boodschap, dat had ik als zomaar zeggen. Thank you. Kijkers, met de woorden van meneer Quincy Sabayo zijn we gekomen aan het einde van het eerste deel van deze aflevering van In Gesprek Met. Zijn oproep om in eenheid verder te gaan was duidelijk. Gaat u nog niet weg, want mijn collega Sifra Goudland heeft nog een deel voor u. Kijkers, welkom bij dit tweede deel van In Gesprek Met. Deel ben ik in gesprek met de Canadese ambassadeur, de heer Mark Berkman, die aan het einde is van zijn termijn. In dit deel praten wij over hoe hij Suriname heeft ervaren de afgelopen drie tot vier jaren en wat de projecten allemaal zijn die Suriname samen met Canada heeft weten te bewerkstelligen. Kijkt u mee. Mr. Mark Bergman, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time again to have a small conversation at a television station. I just, I just heard you're coming to an end to your term as ambassador for Suriname and Guyana. How was your term when you're looking at Suriname, of course? It has gone far too fast. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, shocked that it's coming to an end. But uh, almost four years has gone by far too quickly. Uh, and I lost a few months at the beginning because, of course, I arrived during COVID. And so it was more difficult to travel and to set up meetings the first year that I was here. But uh, I, uh, I, I, I can't say how much I enjoy coming to Suriname every time I have the chance and to st st strengthen and deepen the relationship between Canada and Suriname. 
If, um, if you talk about the period that you came, it was still a bit of a sort of lockdown period, and now that everything is back open, if you make a difference about between then and now, um, what would you tell the people of Suriname what your experiences were? Well, I think right from the beginning, I developed very, uh, very good relationships with the government, with civil society. Uh, it was difficult to meet at the beginning because of uh, because of COVID and because people were reluctant to meet face to face. Uh, in fact, when I first presented credentials, I did it remotely, and then some months later, I came back and uh, presented officially to uh, President Santoki. Um, I think that uh, you know Suriname has gone through some uh, challenging economic times, but uh, you know I'm seeing uh, significant improvements, and uh, we're watching very closely and try to be as supportive as we can uh, as the government of Canada. The last time you spoke, um, there was a collaboration that was signed the day before, I think, between Suriname and Canada on, on a lot of fronts. Um, if you can give us a recap and a review of between a year and now, um, are there changes or are there things that people can expect more? Or are you saying, if I know things are ongoing, some things are in a few years, not everything um, finishes quickly? <laughs> Well, we have, we have different programs and projects here. Uh, we have uh, the Canada Fund for Local Initiatives, which we run out of the High Commission in, uh, in Guyana. And those are funds that are available to civil society organizations. And a number of organizations in uh, Suriname have benefited. It's for projects up to $50,000. So we've worked with uh, indigenous communities. We've worked with women's groups. We've worked with a number of different uh, organizations um, to assist and provide funding for various projects. And that will continue. Um, uh, every year there's a program where uh, civil society organizations can can apply for these for these grants we also have our development programming that are larger amounts of money for longer periods of time and we're currently working with uh, with Suriname government in the field of agriculture and in uh, healthcare and we'll look to expand those areas over the coming years. Uh, we have one project that was just initiated under a project called LEAF, providing uh, cervical cancer screening um, for, uh, for uh, Suriname women. And uh, we um, also uh, have an ongoing project, uh, Sustainable Agriculture in the Caribbean, of which Suriname is one of the main uh, recipients. And we partner very closely with the Ministry of Agriculture, developing uh, sustainable agricultural projects, particularly for women and for communities in some of the more remote uh, parts of Guyana, preparing them to engage in the agricultural market. And it's been very successful. If you if if you look at that because um, people say Suriname is a very green country, so it's very our our soil is very productive, so um, the agriculture it will it, it will certainly boom. Well, I mean, I think one of the main drivers is something that we're watching both here and in Guyana, and that is the CARICOM uh, initiative 25 by 25 which is to reduce food imports into the CARICOM by 25% by 2025. And I think that we all see that Guyana and Suriname are two of the main countries who have the uh, available arable land to become potentially the breadbasket for the CARICOM. So I think um, uh, as, as the agricultural sector develops uh, and, uh, and there's more opportunities for investment, uh, that's something we're looking at very closely and we're, we're very optimistic about that. If you can, if you can um, tell me more about the LEAF project, because um, cervical cancer, people say it's a very sneaky kind of cancer for especially women, aside from breast cancer. Um, is it for... Everybody, um, every woman, I mean, or is it also based for like women in the interior that have a bit of difficulty coming to the mainland? My understanding, it is available uh, throughout Suriname, but I would have to check. That is not, I, I am not an expert in that area. I'm aware of the project. It actually is not run out of, uh, out of Georgetown. It is a program that's run uh, from our Caribbean Regional Development Program based in, in, uh, in uh, 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 
uh, Barbados. And unfortunately, I, I haven't been as involved in that. I'm aware of the project. It's just beginning, but we'll definitely find, uh, provide more detail. Okay, then I guess I have to keep that in mind also to have a little tete-a-tete -tete with the Ministry of Health to see. You can also uh, reach out to my successor who will be coming on board and will be visiting very soon. So uh, I will make sure that they are they're aware of the question and they have the information. Looking forward to it. Um, speaking of your term coming to an end, were there ups and downs aside from the COVID period when you came? <laughs> Well, I think the only, from my perspective, the downside is not being able to get here more often. Um, but we've uh, made a, 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 a conscious decision. If it's not me, it's a members of my team to come as often as that we can to Suriname, whether it's my commercial team, my political team, who's responsible for the Canada Fund for Local Initiative, or the development team, as well as the consular team, who come as often as they can to provide uh, uh, services to do biometrics for, for visas for Surinamese who want to travel to Canada. So we try and have a team here, if not every month, in every couple of months. And, uh, and uh, I know that the, the government of Suriname has talked about a possible Canadian embassy here event, uh, eventually. That's a work in progress. I won't make any commitments to that. But we will ensure that the team in Guyana will continue to be here as often as we possibly can and make sure that uh, the relationship is strengthened. Because I know maybe not an, an embassy, but I know there's a consulate. And the consulate is right, um, right across from ATV, actually. <laughs> We have an honorary consul and, uh, and the team, and they are there to provide assistance uh, with passports and other services. And uh, we backstop that by sending our experts as often as we can. But yes, we have a, an excellent honorary consul and his team here. And uh, we're very lucky to be served with uh, such a, such a capable, capable service. Um, to your knowledge, uh, Mr. Ambassador, do you know if, if the, 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 the um, um, I won't say the footwork, but um, has there been a lot of foot traffic? That's the word I'm, I was searching for. Foot traffic between Surinamese people that try to visit Canada to see how, if, and to your knowledge, of course, um, um, what the opportunities are there for collaborations. Do you have any idea? Uh, certainly the numbers of Surinamese that go to Canada are less than, than certainly Guyana. Um, it's not, a, it's not a, a huge number. There is an interest, and it's raised with me a number of times, uh, the issue of potentially looking at, uh, at uh, jobs or, or uh, grants or for university and that type of thing. And there are some, some, uh, um, some university scholarships that are available through universities. Um, the numbers are not huge, but I think they are, uh, they are slowly growing. Um, the other uh, issue is is uh, investment and Canadian companies, which we're trying to encourage to come down to Suriname to look at the opportunities. Um, I uh, um, I was recently at the PDAC conference in Toronto, which is one of the lo the largest mining conferences in the world, and Minister Abby Mofo was there, and uh, he met with a number of Canadian mining companies who are interested in coming and uh, and uh, looking at the opportunities here. Uh, another field uh, potentially for Canada is, uh, is, is bauxite and, and, of course, oil and gas. So we are trying to encourage Canadian companies to come, to look, to talk, to partner, and potentially to invest. And that's something that I see is growing in the coming years. And during, and during the last um, Tsunami Energy and Oil and Gas Summit, um, were there a few um, Canadians here to try and to have cup of feel? Well, my team was here, um, and uh, um, we're trying to encourage Canadian companies to come down uh, in the coming years. Um, they're certainly aware uh, we have Canadian companies in the oil and gas business, particularly on the service industry side, and some of them are already in Guyana, and so we're encouraging them as oil and gas um, develops here to take a look and look at the opportunities here as well. I think it would be a very good fit. And do, do you think um, the, the, the problem is that um, people don't really know that much about Canada? That, um, that's why the, the, the food traffic is a bit lighter than um, Guyana? Um, well, I think you have to remember, I mean, one to a certain extent is language. 
um, and there's a very large Guyanese diaspora in, in, in Canada. Uh, there is indeed. I mean, the official number is about 100,000, but if you look at second and third generation, it's, it's double that number. So uh, there is a very large diaspora and families going back and back and forward, and that's been the case for many years. The number of uh, Surinamese, uh, there are some, but much smaller numbers. Uh, but I think part of the issue is, is uh, familiarity of Suriname in, in Canada. Uh, that familiarity is maybe not there. Um, certainly part of our job in the High Commission is to do what we can to uh, elevate the, uh, the, uh, the profile of Suriname in Canada. Um, and, and of course, Suriname doesn't have an embassy in, in Ottawa. It's covered from Washington. So we need to find ways to raise the profile of Suriname in, in Canada, uh, particularly in the private sector. Um, but but that, that, that's looking from Canada's side. But also, do you think that s our Surinamese community doesn't really know very much about Canada, just to think, oh, I'm going to go on a vacation to Canada because it's <laughs> the last time we spoke. People have the uh, imagination that Canada is pretty much cold, so I guess that's something that they don't try to get over the hurdle. Well, I encourage Surinamese to come to Canada. In the summer, I can assure you it is not cold. It, uh, right now, unfortunately, we have forest fires because we have a drought. It actually can get very hot in Canada. Uh, over the summer months, and indeed in the winter it is colder. So it depends whether Surinamese want to experience a winter adventure or they want to go when it's hotter and more what they're used to. Uh, but absolutely we encourage, uh, we encourage uh, uh, visits to, uh, to Canada for vacation. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, there are ed educational opportunities as well, which we encourage uh, uh, Suriname students to look at those opportunities. That sounds like a very good day. M Mr. Ambassador, um, after your term ends here, what is there next for you to do in your career? If you'd asked me two days ago, I couldn't have told you, uh, but it was announced yesterday. I'm uh, going as High Commissioner to Jamaica, uh, and I'll be covering uh, Barbados, uh, Turks and Caicos, and Cayman Islands. So I'm delighted to be staying in the region, in the Caribbean region, for another three years. Um, I love the CARICOM region and um, I'm, I'm honoured that my government sees fit to, to allow me to stay and continue to represent Canadian interests in the region. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Not so happy that uh, I won't be able to come in an official capacity to Suriname, but I look forward to coming as a visitor. I almost said you can come as a, uh, as a tourist bag. I look forward to it. There's a number of the remote areas that I didn't get an opportunity to go to. So if I come with a bit more time, I will take the adventure because I, I love getting into the, uh, the hinterland. Out of the, I love Paramaribo, but I would love to get into some of the more remote areas as well and see the beauty of the country. A lot of us do. What is your advice to your, um, the person that comes after you? Um, regarding Suriname? Uh, come more often. Um, take your time to get to know the country. Um, meet people, develop relationships. Um, I think that, uh, you know, although, as you say, maybe Canada isn't as well known to s people in Suriname, they have an impression that we are a, a friend and a good partner. And, uh, and I think that we are, the things, the work that we're doing encourages that. And uh, so I will encourage both my successor and his team to be here as often as they can, to take their time to understand the country, to get to know people, and to hopefully continue the good work that we've been doing over the last few years. Mr. Ambassador, I do love that we can talk for <laughs> hours because it's always so easy to talk to you but um, time is not always our best friend but I really I am thankful that um, we got to say goodbye to you before you left in also our program and um, when we had our conversation so we wish you all the best in your career and hopefully we'll see you back as a tourist and I'm just sorry that I can't talk to people in Dutch but I do my best but uh, it is a pleasure and thank you for giving me this opportunity to say thank you to the people of Suriname thank you to for the hospitality and uh, let me assure you that the relationship between Canada will continue in a positive light
Thank you also. And have a great flight back when you're going. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kijkers, u heeft het verhaal van de heer Beukman gehoord. Het is nu afwachten totdat zijn opvolger zijn credentials zal indienen bij president Chandrika Persat Santoki. Hiermee zijn we aan het eind gekomen van deze aflevering van In Gesprek Met. In het eerste deel zag u mijn collega Richelle Maknak in gesprek met de heer Quincy Sabayo en de danser vanuit de Verenigde Staten. Mocht u deze aflevering hebben gemist, geen nood, de herhaling is er vanavond op kanaal 12.2. Wij zien u volgende week terug met een nieuwe aflevering van In Gesprek Met. Tot dan!